Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Columbia. We are excited to worship, pray, give, and study God's Word together with you. Before we begin, here's what's happening at First. Today is a very special Sunday in which we are focusing our attention on God's miraculous work all around the world. If you were in Sunday school, you've already heard the testimonies from our highlighted missionaries. This evening at 6 p.m. in Ellis Hall, we're going to gather and celebrate with these missionaries again. You'll hear a little more from each missionary and their evangelism efforts. God is calling the nations to himself, and we are blessed to be a part of it. So come and be encouraged by the good news impacting the world. There isn't any registration, so bring as many friends as you would like this evening. Save the date for our fall festival coming up in about a month on Sunday, October 27th. We'll have music and food, games, and trunk or treating. This is a great event for all families and the perfect opportunity to invite your neighbors and friends to join you for some fun. In order to make the evening the best it can be, we are looking for sponsors of trunks. Team up with your Sunday school class or small group and turn a boring trunk into an exciting interactive experience. We also need volunteers for registration, tickets, greeting, and more. It takes a village to make everything run smoothly, which is why we need all kinds of people working together to bring the fall festival to life. Sign up to volunteer or sponsor a trunk on our website at fbccola.com forward slash events. We are still looking for volunteers for the Good News Club. This is an after school program for elementary aged children using music, Bible stories, and scripture memory to tell the good news of Jesus. Our club at Brennan Elementary has already begun, but our Meadowfield Club is starting this Thursday, October 10th. By volunteering, you're committing one day a week for six weeks from 2.30 to 4 p.m. This is a great opportunity to minister to children who may never step into a church building. Find out more and sign up online at fbccola.com forward slash events. Church family, here is a special message from our missions minister, Todd Elkins, about your gifts to help provide relief and aid to those most devastated by Hurricane Helene. Thank you so much, First Baptist, for all you've given. All these supplies you see behind me being loaded up are about to be taken to the tractor trailer, which will go up tomorrow to First Baptist Hendersonville. They've got a hub that's reaching out to all those affected by Hurricane Helene. So I just want to say thank you so much for all your giving. Thank you so much for your compassion and care for those who are suffering right now. And just, uh, we did a great job, but continue praying for those who are in need. Thank you very much. Are you new or visiting? We're glad you're here. Stop by the connection desk in the foyer before you leave today. We have a gift for you. And if you have any questions about following Jesus, baptism, or becoming a member, come by the connection desk after the service to speak to a counselor. We look forward to meeting you. If you'd like to hear more details about everything I just mentioned and more, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter at fbccola.com. Now, let's worship together.
Well, thank you, Betty, and handbells, wonderful message, Rejoice, the Lord is King. I thought it would be very appropriate and good as we begin our service in this early part for us just to bow our heads. Let's all bow our heads together and let's take opportunity to pray for all those who have suffered so much in this hurricane. Some still don't have power on. Some have lost family members, lost all they've had. They're needing help, they're needing assistance. So many people who are helping, all the first responders and then wonderful people who are filling in to help. So right now, would you just go to the Lord and lift all these folks up in prayer? We don't know all the needs, but the Lord sure does. Lord Jesus, as we begin this service, we are reminded that there are many who are hurting, who are in need, who need help, who need hope. And we just pray that through all the different, uh, different organizations, wonderful organizations like Samaritan's Purse, that they will be ministered to, that they can uh, be reached, that uh, people can help them. We thank you for the efforts that have gone forth from our church. And we pray that we would continue to lift everyone up in prayer and be attentive to the needs that are there. So we love you today, Lord, and we thank you for the privilege and the honor of being able to be together in corporate worship. So our heart cry is glory, glory to the Lamb. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Shall we stand as we sing together?
wonderful. You can clap for that. We'll clap for that. Y'all can sit down. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. It's so good to see you all here today. And we do have some celebrations to announce. New baby boy, Wesley Allen Wunderlich, born October 1st to Andrew and Shelby Wunderlich, grandparents George and Wendy Knox, and great-grandmother Brenda Noe. And you be praying for that sweet baby as he is still in the hospital right now. We also have Teddy Henson Rothell, born October 5th to Jared and Olivia Rothell. And you be praying for them as well. Couple, or a birthday to celebrate, Buster Brown, who's worshiping with us by television, turned 93 on September 24th. Happy birthday, Mr. Buster. And celebrating an anniversary this past week, Ron and Pam Carroll, you can stand up over here, celebrated their 55th anniversary on October 3rd. Congratulations to you too. Well, it is Global Mission Sunday here at First Baptist Church, and so if you were in Sunday school, you got to hear from some of our mission partners. And uh, this evening, we have our Global Mission celebration at 6 p.m. in Ellis Hall. I want to encourage you to be there to hear what the Lord's doing in our community and literally around the world. It'll be a wonderful time to uh, be challenged, but also to find out how we can be praying and giving and going to be a part of God's global mission. Well, if you're visiting with us today, we're so glad that you're here, and uh, we'd love to find out how we can get you connected at First Baptist Church. To do that, just complete the Connect card at the bottom of the uh, bulletin, or you can go online and then stop by the Connection Desk at the conclusion of the service where we have a gift just for you, and we can answer your questions and help you find a spot where you can fit in here at First Baptist Church. Well, how about we take this time now and stand up and turn and greet those around us as we continue to worship.
Father God, thank you so much for that amazing grace. Now, Father, we are reminded this week that the earth can change, but God, you never change. Father, thank you that you are sovereign, that you are good, and Lord, that your grace is always available. Father, thank you today for those who have given. Uh, Father, uh, may they know that every dollar given goes to reach those who are lost without Christ. And Father, as we continue to worship, bless us now, Father, may we be anxious to hear the word of God, and we pray this in the wonderful, strong name of Jesus, amen.
so grateful for our choir. Y'all preached a great sermon there to remind us we have something to boast in. For many of us, it's not our sports team, but it is Jesus, and we can boast in him and what he's done. Well, I want to say to you before I begin the message, I'm so thankful to be a part of this congregation. You just showed up an incredible way to care for the communities that have been affected by the storm. Uh, You filled up the lobby space in the 1420 Sumter building with uh, canned goods and uh, non-perishable meat and diapers and formula and cleaning supplies. It was just incredible. They loaded all of it up. They'd already taken one load up earlier in the day, but then on, I mean, other, earlier in the week, and then on Friday, an 18-wheeler was filled with those goods and goods from other churches in our community, shipped up to First Baptist Church Hendersonville, where it is being deployed there for those uh, who still, of course, um, many, most perhaps without power, and of course, greater needs than just that. And um, so I just, I'm thankful for you uh, participating in that ministry project. And you think, well, Wes, the need is still there, and it sure is, especially uh, folks in our own state. We have our Baptist disaster relief teams that are out serving, uh, that are still doing some cleanup projects and then uh, feeding in certain areas. I know they were down in Aiken uh, this uh, past weekend, and then also been uh, at teams up in the upstate and in Greenwood and um, just all kinds of places. And so you may say, maybe there's still a way I can support by bringing goods. We'll put out the word this week of what they might be looking for, and we'll distribute those through our sister churches of those who have needs. And then, of course, you can always give. And if you go online to our uh, First Baptist Church website, fbccola.com slash give, on the drop-down menu, there's something for disaster relief. And um, every dollar that's given there will be distributed uh, for our disaster relief teams in our own community and uh, the surrounding areas, but also in the hardest hit areas. And so I would encourage you to continue to be participating and by praying, but you might also want to serve. And so there may be a place for you. If that's something you want to do, find out where there's a place you can serve. You reach out to our missions office this week and we'll see if there's a place for you to, uh, to participate in that. Well, in case you have not heard, um, in the West Church household, it's officially Christmas season. Uh, you, many of you may know this, but the day after my birthday, I start turning on Christmas music. So my birthday September 25th, you can make a note of that for next year, but <laughs> September 26th, I start playing Christmas music. And I know you probably think that's crazy because you live by a lot of rules and you say, you know what, you should have no Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. And you get mad when you walk in the stores and you see the stuff out before Halloween. You think, what in the world? But when it comes to those kinds of things, I live by the Outback mantra, which is no rules, just right. And as for me and my household, we have decided 90 days of Christmas music is what we need. And uh, you probably think, is that all you listen to? It's not. I listen to other things. But my kids know, and they love it, I think, whenever I turn on Christmas music (laughs) the day after my birthday. And... um, And how about how meaningful it's been for me and my family because this week in our consumed reading plan, we turned the pages from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So we've been reading all about the Christmas narrative. We've been reading about the fullness of time and the birth of Christ. And so if you need an excuse, you're like, Wes, I just can't do crazy things like that. There's your excuse because we've made it to Christmas in our Bible reading plan so you can start listening to Christmas music too. Now, primarily, I do it just because I like to. It's fun, right? Uh, But there may be a little bit of a theological idea that I use to explain why I do that. Uh, You know, the Advent season is intended to build within us this um, longing or anticipation for the arrival of Christmas morning when we celebrate the birth and the coming of the Lord's Christ into the world. We celebrate the birth of the Deliverer, the one who would crush the head of the serpent. And so this season of Advent gives us maybe a taste of what the ancient Israelite would have experienced in longing for the coming of the Messiah. So I just extend it a little bit so that I can let the anticipation build. Well, we all know the heaviness that comes along with waiting when you've had to wait for something. And some of you now, I'm, some of you kids are thinking, oh man, it's almost Christmas and it's going to be a long time to wait for it. But um, that, that's kind of, we know that. We know the heaviness that comes along with waiting in our hearts and in our minds. And many of you experienced that in dramatic fashion over the last couple of weeks um, as you waited for the power to be turned on. Um, In fact, I heard an amen back there. Some of you 
may still be waiting on the power. If not here in the Midlands, um, in our, uh, those who are joining us online and by television, whether it's down in Aiken and Augusta area or in Greenwood or the upstate and Anderson or even into Western North Carolina, know that many people are still waiting on power. And uh, in fact, my parents in Spartanburg are still without power. Um, and when you don't have power, you're waiting and you're waiting on the power to be restored. It can become all consuming. Some of y'all experience that. You're checking with other people to see, has your power been turned on? You're kind of walking through the neighborhood to see, are there any linemen here? And then you're, you know, trying to occupy your time. And it's like, what can I do while I wait on the power? And, and then all of a sudden you realize there are things that you took for granted. And now you're having to keep a generator running so that your refrigerator can stay on. And you're trying to figure out how you can stay cool at night. And you're f- trying to figure out how to wash your clothes. It's just this idea of waiting. It, it can make you anxious. And some of you have some real serious concerns or family members with real serious concerns that make them even more anxious when the power's out. And then there comes that glorious day when perhaps you've been out, you've been away from home, and all of a sudden you drive up through your neighborhood and you turn into the driveway and you see on the front porch the glowing light. Nobody knows just how good that feeling is. The power is on, right, you know? Now I want you to imagine a whole civilization of people walking in the darkness of sin and in a world void of God, choking on hopelessness, yearning for deliverance, more than just dealing with the inconvenience of power outages, more than just localized devastation and destruction, more than heavy hearts from grief because of what loved ones are going through, the world in which Christ was born was held captive by darkness and desperation. And that imagery helps us grasp the longing that the people of ancient Israel felt, the Lord's faithful as they were yearning for the arrival of Jesus into the world. The Gospel of Luke tells us of one particular man described as righteous and devout who was waiting to see the Lord's Christ before he dies. And he knew God's plan. And he believed God would console Israel by sending a deliverer. This man's name was Simeon. And we're going to look at the moment when he saw Jesus, the Messiah. This year, as we have been reading through the Bible together, we've placed attention on grasping the grand narrative of Scripture from beginning to end. You know, we, we, we know from the, all the way from the very beginning when God created that first man and first woman, God made him in his image and he placed him into a pristine world, then it all came crashing down when they yielded to temptation and fell into sin. And sin ruined everything. The ground was cursed, the people were cursed, life was cursed, but the world was never abandoned. God began to unfold at that point his redemptive plan where he would redeem and restore everything broken by sin. Simeon knew that plan. He had heard it, spoken of by the prophets, read of it in the word. He had even sensed it in his own being that God has not left us on his own, and he longed for the appearance of the Messiah. And so as we've been going through this consumed reading plan, we've paid attention how that redemptive plan unfolds with God calling Abram, establishing a nation and people. And it's a nation and people through which he was going to send deliverance. He cared for this nation and people, even when they went into bondage in Egypt. Then he sends deliverance through Moses. He also sends a covenant and law to protect these people so that he can come and dwell among them. And then under Joshua's leadership, they're led to a promised land. And that nation and people becomes a kingdom that's reigned over by a throne. And there's this long royal line that follows in the righteous reign of King David. But the kingdom divides. And all of a sudden, the only part of the nation that's left is the southern kingdom of Judah. Then Judah's led into exile, and for decades, God's chosen people long to go home until finally they return to their promised land. Now, all through the scriptures, throughout the ages, God had spoken to the people through prophets, and then all of a sudden, it went silent. 400 years, no prophetic word in Israel. Surely the people thought, he's forgotten us. He's abandoned the plan. We're hopeless. We're desperate. But there were a faithful few that believed. And then all of a sudden, there were rumors that God began to speak. You know this part of the story. To Zechariah and Elizabeth, the angelic appearances to Mary and Joseph. You know the story of Caesar and his census, thinking he was in control, but God was just getting the world moving so that on that faded night, 
Mary and Joseph could have arrived in Bethlehem. And it's there that an angelic appearance to the shepherds and the birth of the baby. They stay there for a while, establish a household there in Bethlehem until they flee to Egypt for safety and then eventually land back in Galilee where they raise their son, Jesus. Well, as we read through the gospel accounts in our consumed reading plan, I'm going to preach a series of messages from the book of Luke, responding to the question, why did he come? Because we know a lot of the details. We're familiar with the text. We know the what, but we want to look at the why. And so this morning, we're going to answer the question, why did he come, with a message entitled, He Came to Save, from Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to turn with me now to Luke chapter 2, where I'm going to pick up in verse 21, and I'll read to you now verses 21 through 35. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision... His name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for the purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God. And said, now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed For the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, Father, would you speak to us through your word, point us to the truths of your gospel, draw us all to the cross of Christ today. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. In the text, we see how God uses Simeon to declare that this baby named Jesus is no ordinary baby. He is the long-awaited Messiah. And what I hope that you'll grab hold of this morning in this message is that Jesus' arrival was not coincidental. This just didn't fall into place through happenstance. It was intentional. Jesus came to save us from our sins. How did he arrive? He was born under the law, born to usher salvation, and born to utterly amaze. And so we're going to begin there under the heading, Jesus is born under the law. Now there are three key events that are described here in the text that were dictated by the law. There's circumcision, purification, and presentation. Uh, The fact that Luke tells us about these events indicates that Mary and Joseph were determined to raise their son according to the scriptures. Verse 21 says, on the eighth day, Jesus is circumcised. Of course, this is ancient custom, ancient law, and uh, every male child is to be presented uh, before uh, the Lord and is to be circumcised. So Mary and Joseph do that. And Luke uh, tells us that their son is officially called Jesus, which of course is the name that was given to them by the angel. Um, In fact, we read in Matthew um, 121 that Joseph, I mean, the angel that appeared to Joseph said, she will bear a son, speaking of Mary. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So even his name reveals that Jesus came to save. But he doesn't merely enter the world as a visiting deity. If we didn't know the gospel, if we didn't know these stories, and you imagine God, were to vi- God was to visit the world, we wouldn't picture it like this. But Jesus comes, he comes in flesh. He's a baby. He's born under the law. He submits himself to his own law. And then we read on the 40th day, 
that Jesus' parents, again, demonstrate their faithfulness to the scriptures when they travel to the temple with Jesus for the purification rites. Now, once again, dictated by the law, uh, Leviticus 12 describes how a woman who gives birth, birth to a son on the 40th day is uh, to bring an offering of a couple of birds. Uh, it also, it says a lamb and a bird, but in this case, because of their um, need, they only brought two birds, and that sacrifice is burned to atone for her uncleanness. Additionally, Luke explains that they brought Jesus to the temple as an act of presentation, Because even all the way back to Exodus, it speaks about how the first offspring male should be dedicated to the Lord. The male that opens the womb should be presented to the Lord and called holy to the Lord. So Jesus' parents are a righteous couple. They yield to the requirement of the law. They fill the demands, I mean, excuse me, fulfill the demands for circumcision, uh, purification, and for presentation. What we don't read about in this text is a savior who comes as one who is above the law, or a savior who comes who is out of touch with the people that he has come to save. Rather, what we discover is that Jesus comes and from the very beginning, he identifies with those he has come to save. The apostle Paul describes Jesus' identification with the people he came to save and his incarnation in Galatians 4. Verse four, it says, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, that's Jesus, born of a woman, that's Mary, born under the law, just as we've seen displayed here, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So Jesus comes in the flesh, so he's fully God, but now the scriptures are clear, he becomes fully man. And this God-man submits himself to the righteous requirement of the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. And that's what he did. But why did he did it? Why did he do it? So that we might be saved. When I was a kid, I remember um, hearing a story almost every Christmas uh, that was told. It's just a story, but it's to illustrate a point about the Lord Jesus coming. And it's a story about a man who had serious doubts about the incarnation of God. He could not believe that Jesus was more than just mere mortal. He thought, sure, he's a great teacher. Perhaps he was a great miracle worker, but I cannot believe that Jesus is God. And so he had all these doubts. And so one year, uh, his family went to church to worship on Christmas Eve, and he chose to stay home because he says, I cannot go and pretend to believe something I don't believe. And so he stays home. And while, after they've left, while he's sitting there, all of a sudden a winter storm starts to fall on the village. And he can see it through his window, watches the snow as it's coming down, and it's, it's creating quite a problem out there. And then all of a sudden he notices this flock of birds who has gotten stuck in the snow, who've gotten trapped in the storm. And they're trying to figure their way out, but they're disoriented. And they start flying towards the window of his home to try to get in, to find safety, you know, to get out of this storm. And so he watches this for a while and he says, I can't just let them die out there. So he goes outside, he opens the doors to his barn and he turns on the light and it's kind of like, come on y'all, you can go in here, but they don't go. So he goes inside and he grabs breadcrumbs and he tries to, you know, lure them in with food. Still, they don't come. He starts chasing after them, trying to shepherd them in. They're just flying in the air and landing back down. And he's getting frustrated and concerned. And he says, if only I were a bird. If I were a bird, I could lead the way. I could show them into the barn. I could lead. They wouldn't be so intimidated by me and my appearance. If only I could just become like one of them for just a moment, then I could save them. The story says that at that moment, he hears the church bells ring, and it just clicks in his mind. That's why God came, so that we could follow him, so that we could understand his heart for us, so that he could lead us to salvation. Jesus came in the flesh to save us, and his incarnation makes, us e- makes it easier for us to trust God and to understand his heart. We find in the birth of Jesus that the Christ identifies with the people he came to save. So Jesus is born under the law. <clears throat> 40, days, <clears throat> 40 days after his birth, his um, 
He accompanies his parents to the temple for the purification requirements to be dedicated as holy to the Lord. And while they're there, he bumps into, or they bump into, um, this devout man named Simeon who declares that Jesus is born to usher salvation. Simeon is a fascinating figure, but we really know very little about him. Um, The only biographical information you'll find is in these 11 verses that are found here in Luke 2. Now, we know he's a God-fearing man. And we know that, uh, or tradition tells us he was an old man. But you know, the scriptures doesn't say he's old. They don't say he's old. Um, And as a matter of fact, tradition says he was 113 years old. I don't know where they came up with that, but that's what they say. The scriptures don't call him old. They just say he was waiting to die, waiting to see the Lord so he could die. And so the only biographical information we have is right here. He's righteous, he's devout, and he has this special revelation from the Spirit. In fact, the the scripture reads as if the Holy Spirit dwelled on him, unlike the Holy Spirit would dwell with others. Because when we read in the Old Testament accounts or the gospel accounts, the Holy Spirit would come and leave and come and leave. But it appears from the text that the Holy Spirit resides, has chosen to abide with Simeon prior to Pentecost. It's an amazing thing. And he reveals to him in some way that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. So he's been waiting. And I think that's why we have this tradition that he's old because it sounds like he's probably been waiting for a long time and he says at the end I'm ready to die is kind of what he says so and then all of a sudden he sees the incarnate Christ so this is 40 days after the birth of Jesus Simeon like all the people without power is waiting just like he had waited every day before wakes up waiting and on this day and for some reason the spirit leads him to go to the temple that's what it says the spirit brings him to the temple he probably had done that before Perhaps there have been other times he came into the temple and he wondered, will this be the day? Or maybe he thought this is going to be the day. But here he was, the scriptures say he's devout, he's righteous, so we can assume that he's there in the temple worshiping and he's praying, he's longing for God to come and deliver his people when all of a sudden, out of the corner of his eye perhaps, he sees this young couple with these two birds bringing it for sacrifice with their baby boy. Now we don't know what it was. I guess it was the prompting of the Spirit. He walks over to this young lady, and he says to her, can I hold your boy? (laughs) And I just think, that's a strange moment. I don't know about the young moms you've met, but I just can't imagine a young mom saying, sure, to this strange man. I imagine she probably bumbled over her words (laughs) and looked at Joseph like, I'm not sure we should put the Lord's anointed in this man's hands. Somehow it happens. All of a sudden, here's this baby boy in the hands of Simeon. And we can only imagine the feeling of satisfaction, of joy, of relief that floods his soul. Like driving home and finding the lights are on after you've been without power. He's so overwhelmed, he breaks out into song because he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. And you think, what does salvation look like? Like Jesus. Simeon didn't need to see Jesus in the temple at 12 years old teaching the learned men a lesson. He didn't need to see Jesus in the baptismal waters whenever the Lord spoke from heaven. He didn't need to see Jesus calling the disciples or healing the lame or teaching on the mountain above the Galilee. He didn't need to hear the parables. He didn't need to be there at the transfiguration. He didn't need to see Jesus at Calvary or Jesus' grave empty. He looked into the face of Jesus and he knew, I have seen the salvation of my people. And his song is actually a missionary song. Today's Global Mission Sunday here at First Baptist Church. And we see here in the text, in the presence of all people, he says, a light of revelation has shown not just for the Jew, not just for the faithful one here in the temple, but to the Gentiles. God has come to save all people who will believe in him. He didn't just come for his chosen nation. He came from God through that chosen nation to save the world. Simeon saw and he knew who this was. His experience reminds us that to see Jesus is to see God's salvation. Right now we live in a world where people are looking for salvation in all kinds of different places. Perhaps you come here looking for salvation today in your own way. Some are searching for hope and fulfillment in all kinds of different ways. They go to great lengths to find it. Look for it in relationships with people that will ultimately let them down. They search for it in 
sexual pleasure, some other fleeting gratification. They seek it from the affirmation of the people around them. They try to obtain this satisfaction, this gratification, this meaningfulness that they are seeking. They try to obtain it through money or power or fame or glory. Some turn to religion thinking, well, if I can have this transcendent experience, perhaps it will give me the hope that I'm looking for. Or some just search deep within. The answer is just deep within. I've got to be true to my own self, you know? To my own self, I've got to be true. Some try to center themselves in the universe, thinking that they'll find what they're looking for if they can just find their place in the world. Some believe that salvation is still found in the law. That if I can do more good than bad, then all of a sudden I'll have the confidence to face God in judgment. Or if I can keep, for the most part, the Ten Commandments to the best of my ability, then I'll be saved. But Simeon reminds us salvation is found in no one else. For there is only one name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. And that's the name of Jesus. So look to Jesus for salvation. And if you look to him, then remember, Christianity is a missional faith. If you've already looked to him for salvation, then you need to be pointing to him for salvation. In fact, on this Global Mission Sunday, I would say, how can you live on mission with God? A few easy ways to do that is to pray. You can pray for what God's doing. I know you pray for people in need, but do you pray for their souls? Are you just concerned with what you see unfolding on the news? Or are you concerned about the biggest problem our world faces, which is sin and people dying and go to, going to hell? Pray for them. Perhaps you can give. Last week we looked at how the scriptures command us to give, but you also have the opportunity to join with God by using the resources he's already blessed you with to make an eternal difference in the lives of people in your own community and all literally around the world. Rachel and I give above the tithe here so that our dollars can reach the furthest shore of this world because we're concerned about the people that are there. So you can give. You can also go. Some people that are here, they, they go and they're participating in mission trips. Or perhaps they're even praying about landing on the mission field as a career. You can also, you don't have to go around the world. Truth is you can go across the street. You can go down the hall. You can go next door. Because there are plenty of people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus. To live on mission is to say yes to Jesus wherever he sends you. So Simeon concludes his song of praise. And then it starts to get a little bit dark. He turns to prophecy. And we find here that Jesus was born to utterly amaze. So Simeon sings this song of praise to God about the baby boy. Then verse 33 says, Mary and Joseph are amazed by that. They're in awe of what God was doing. And of course, this is not the first time they've been amazed. There's a series of amazing moments in their life. Luke says that Mary is treasuring it all up in her heart. And we know she recalls it probably throughout Christ's lifetime. Every mother is proud of their newborn baby, and they're amazed at all these things that uh, people say about their child, and they take such pride in that. But of course, Mary has these prophetic words and this miraculous story to accompany her uh, maternal pride. So here she is, and the stranger in the temple takes her son and begins to declare, God's going to save his people through this boy. And I'm sure Mary and Joseph turned to themselves every once in a while and said, do you think all that was true? Did that really happen? And then they have moments like this to reinforce what they knew to be true. But very quickly, the gladness of verse 31 and 32 is mixed with sadness in verses 34 and 35. The amazing thing God has done in sending Jesus elicits praise from Simeon's lips. But we can tell from the text that Simeon also sees the redemptive plan begin to unfold. He can see Calvary. He sees the darker part of the story. And it's still amazing because it's a gift that God has given to his people. Now, um, he uses it three images here. One is not mentioned, but I think it's implied in the text. He, he mentions a stone, and then he mentions a sign, and he mentions a sword. The stone is not mentioned, but he talks about how this man will lead to the rise and fall of many. It reminds me of this picture that's painted all throughout Scripture. Like in Psalm 18, verse 22, it says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
So we have this picture in Scripture of how Jesus is a cornerstone, and it will lead to the rise of many as people build their lives upon him. But so many will reject him. And in fact, Peter describes it as becoming a stumbling block or a stumbling stone. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, it says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and this doom they were also appointed. So as much as some in Israel will rise by following Jesus, many will stumble and fall because they cannot accept him, particularly the Jew. That's what the scriptures speak about over and over again, that his own people over and over again reject him. Sadly, we see the same thing happening in our own day, as people have a difficult time trusting Jesus to be the cornerstone. He also says the child will be appointed as a sign to be opposed, is what he says. So it's not a sign as in a symbol, but a sign as in a revelation of truth. And we know how much people hate to hear the truth. That's why they hate this book. They don't like the truth. Well, the sign Jesus, this revelation of truth, they despised, they opposed him. When he performed miracles and healings, they questioned, they accused him of being, a, of being demon-possessed. When he welcomed sinners and people far from God, they questioned his character. As he's being crucified, they mock him. After his resurrection, they d- doubt and then lie about his resurrection. People will go to great truths, I mean, great lengths to reject truth. Jesus was a sign. He was a revelation of truth, greatly opposed. He was a stone that they stumbled upon. Then Simeon goes even darker. For Mary, he says that a sword will pierce her own soul. Think about the grief that Mary will face. Not just at Calvary, but all the days and weeks and years leading up to that moment. As she watches him suffer, as she watches him rejected, And then ultimately, of course, killed on a cross. Jesus attracted a lot of attention in his life. And even in the darker moments, his appearance was amazing. And the question would be, uh, would be, will he be accepted or will, as the chief cornerstone, or will he be rejected as a rock of offense, a stone of stumbling? Jesus' appearance forces everyone to determine in their hearts Will they believe that he is who he says he is? In fact, I would ask you today, just like Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say Jesus is? Answering that question is a critical question for your eternal destination. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you think he's just a good teacher, an incredible miracle worker? Maybe you think he was a rebel rouser, a revolutionary. Or you may believe he's just another prophet, And a long line of spiritual guides, the only reliable record declares, though, that Jesus is much more than any of that. He is the son of the living God, the long-awaited one, the great deliverer who has come to crush the head of the serpent. The question we're asking in this message is, why did he come? Why did God have to send him? I couldn't help but think of Romans chapter 8, verse 3, where he says, he explains, the law wasn't good enough. In fact, he says in verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do, what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. God sent his son to save. The law couldn't save. There's no one righteous. The scripture says not even one. No one will be declared righteous by way of the law. So then how are people to be saved? How can sins be forgiven? How can relationship with God be restored? Only through Jesus. You can't earn it, so it's got to be grace and grace alone. It's by faith alone, through the finished work of Jesus on the cross alone. Have you trusted in Jesus for salvation? If so, when's the last time you shared the good news of Jesus with someone around you? We have two duties when it comes to responding to Jesus. The first is to Will you believe him? Will you believe he is who he says he is? Will you place faith in him? The second is, will you share him with others? That's our responsibility as believers. There may be others, but those are critical, to believe in him and then to share him. I would hope that today that you would choose to follow Jesus, and I would hope that you would walk out of this place today motivated to share him with those around you. Our Father in God, we thank you for the hope of the gospel. 
We thank you for the opportunity to respond to you by faith. Now, in this moment, would you speak to our hearts? It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our choir's gonna sing, and perhaps you have a decision to make. You can make it right where you are, or I'll be right down front, and I can receive you to pray with you. So you stand. As our choir sings, you respond. I don't want you to miss this opportunity. We have staff and volunteers at our connection desk that would love to pray with you, answer your questions about trusting Jesus for salvation, finding how how you can get plugged into our church, perhaps following believers' baptism, get plugged into a small group where you can grow in faith, maybe join in the fellowship of our church through membership. So don't miss this opportunity. At the conclusion of our service, you just meet our staff and volunteer right back here in the foyer at the connection desk. I want to remind you, as we spoke of before, that uh, this evening we have our global mission celebration at 6 p.m. in Ellis Hall. It'll be a time of some testimony, perhaps a couple songs there, and uh, surely the Lord will motivate our hearts there to uh, live on mission for him. Pray, give, go, and share Jesus with every opportunity we have. So I look forward to seeing you back tonight at 6 o'clock. Of course, I want to remind you of the ways that you can be supporting um, our uh, disaster relief efforts and would encourage you to continue to pray and to give and maybe there's opportunity for you to serve and we'll make those things available to you through social media this week of what we might be looking for to be able to uh, support our disaster relief teams in our own area and across our state. Now, I I do want to mention just because it's been a year um, uh, and uh, we, we watch on the news how Um, the war in the Middle East is uh, continuing to escalate. So a year ago, tomorrow, of course, uh, began an incredible invasion in Israel that led to a devastating war and the loss of so many lives. And, of course, now it's spreading. And um, I would encourage you, as the Scriptures command us, uh, to be praying, and particularly for the peace of Israel. So I'm going to invite you to stand, and I'm going to offer that prayer and then our benediction, and then we'll sing and we will... Can we, can we... Conclude. Can we just do something real yes, quick you before sure can. you pray? Yeah. Just give me a chord. Joy to the world, there you go. the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. How about that? That's That's wonderful. He said, that's for me, and I know it, but I do also know you've been wanting to sing a duet with me for a very long time, so we (laughs) pulled it off. Two birds with one stone. Father, as you command, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. Now may the keeper of Israel keep you. May God our Father keep you from stumbling. May the Son of God keep you near the cross. May the Spirit of God keep you from sin. Amen.
thank you for joining us for worship today. For more information and to join us in reading through the Bible this year, please visit consumed.life. We look forward to seeing you next week.